We must move on to questions to the Assembly Commission. And before I call Mr Raymond McCartney, I wish to advise the House that questions 2 and 8 have been withdrawn. Mr McCartney. Good morning, Mr. Chief Last Concur. Question number one, please. Gawn buich a slechen gualte as an gest. Hug cuig a dos gal courtier ar gnuf na Parliament chun dara la de vian ar gavila kerjeg. Ar hu shavi fe ha bans gal fe ni bans gal agus tri gal specialta. Len a question hug clash de bresh agus ar dejikus a wan courtiering. Kom ai le hug jeg institute ar dejikus daunda la hai in ker klar dejikus. Can I thank the member for his question? 52 schools have visited Parliament buildings since 2 January 2014. Of these, 20 were primary schools, 29 were secondary, and three were special schools. In addition, one further in higher education college and 18 worldwide higher education institutions have visited for an education programme input. With reference to the Assembly constituency issue, primary schools from 12 constituencies have visited in this period. No primary school from South Belfast, West Belfast, East Derry, Foyle, Newry and, Ar and Armagh or South Down has yet to visit Parliament buildings this year. Apart from the Belfast East constituency from which three primary schools visited Parliament buildings, either one or two primary schools have visited from each of the other constituencies. In the same period, secondary schools from 16 constituencies have visited Parliament buildings. East Belfast, Lagan Valley were the only constituencies from which secondary schools have not yet visited Parliament buildings this year. Between one and three secondary schools have visited from each of the other constituencies. The member may also wish to note that from January to December 2013, 198 schools visited Parliament buildings. Mr McCartney for a supplement. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the member for her answer. Uh, could she please outline perhaps what plans or what uh, programmes are in place or what actions are being taken to ensure that we extend the, 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 the run of schools that come to the building? Well, Garamagot Fuin Keshchin, thank you for that question. I'm going to talk about the service of education in the service of Mar Yalar Glushat in Vonak Fernia Agasira Wairchas. Tonafalunta Shah Alinu Gashaladok Agas Tatarig Drem Le Fwirin Ave Bost Fuin Feha Kahru La de Warta. To Afra Nu Yenever and Glor for Rokdana, Educus Les and Salahar Shah Lanu, Lena Kintu, Garfader Les Scholar Bet Nakwilabal to Korcha Korcha Fergnav de Parliamentia, As Kabe Fa, Garfader Lehi, Korch for Rokdana, a Yenev. Staffing within the education service has been at 50% since mid-December 2013 as a result of internal staff movement and maternity leave. These vacancies are in the process have been filled on a temporary basis and staff are expected to be in post by 24th of March. A review of the education outreach programme has currently been undertaken with the intention of extending this provision to ensure that any school which for whatever reason cannot attend Parliament buildings can avail of an outreach visit. I want to call Mr. Tom Elliott. Uh, question number two. Question number three, Principal Deputy Speaker. <laughs> Leslie Cree, Tim. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I'm glad that we're on the same question. Um, I thank the member for that question. Uh, the Assembly appointed an acting commissioner for standards on a motion from the Committee on Standards and Privileges. As a result, the Assembly Commission has incurred costs to date totalling £346.84 in respect of travel and accommodation. The total split is as follows. Travel, £271.84 and accommodation, £75. A further sum of approximately £225 will be payable in respect of travel and accommodation costs arising from the Acting Commissioner's attendance at the Committee on Standards and Privileges meeting which was held on Wednesday the 5th of March. No additional costs were incurred in respect of remuneration payments to the Acting Commissioner as he was appointed on the same per diem terms as the Commissioner. Mr Elliott for a supplement. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the uh, member for that uh, answer. Uh, could the member maybe give us some details as to why the, the current Commissioner I uh, couldn't actually hear the case on why there had to be an interim one appointed. 
Again, I thank the member for his question. Uh, the Commissioner was appointed under the terms of the Assembly Members Independent Financial Review and Standards Act, Northern Ireland 2011. I'm sure you knew that anyway. Schedule 3 to the Act specifically provided for the holders of certain posts or offices to be disqualified from appointment as the Commissioner. A conflict of interest can arise in many circumstances, especially in a small place like Northern Ireland. In this case, the conflict arose because the Commissioner had been a member of the Parades Commission. Members of the Parades Commission are not included in the lengthy list of people who are disqualified from appointment as the Commissioner. When this conflict of interest emerged, it was managed in a proper manner through the appointment of an acting Commissioner. Here comes to Jim Allister. In terms of the Commission's oversight of expenditure, does the Commission have any oversight of the shameless squander that we saw over the weekend when the Committee on Standards uh, took themselves five members to Washington, etc., as part of that particular jamboree and spent a large amount of money, uh, three of them from one party, one might add, to look at a document on ethics that is reported they can download? Has the Commission any oversight? on the squander by committees in this House. not sure whether I thank the member for that question or not. Uh, but uh, the simple answer is no, the, com the Commission does not have that responsibility. I'm glad to say on this occasion. Sir Raymond McCartney. calling me. Uh, in relation to the last member when he asked about being money being squandered on this trip as well, uh, is, do, would you accept that the money was squandered and have they bring in the Commissioner to rule against uh, the person who made the, the allegation in the first place? You know, I think that's called democracy, isn't it? No, no. Dandling that. Good <laughs> McNary. Question four. I will be thanking him for a supplementary whenever I hear it. But, uh, the Assembly Commission uh, has responsibility for Parliament buildings and its immediate environs. In terms of definition of the immediate environs, the, the land outside of the building is delineated by the railings that surround the front lawn and by the security fencing to the north, i.e. the rear of the building, uh, and at the east and west sides of the building. Mr David McNary for a supplementary. Principal uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, according to many visitors, uh, we do not appear to be user friendly toward them, uh, who on a, a day like today battle uphill in the rain, having parked downhill. Uh, are there plans uh, to provide closer proximity parking for visitors? And if not, would the Commission consider being uh, more user friendly toward our visitors and guests? Well, I do thank the member actually for a supplementary. Uh, I suppose there's a couple of points in relation to that, which I think we originally intended to cover at an earlier stage. Um, first of all, as was strictly speaking, the control of parking outside of its environs are not a matter that's under the direct control of the Assembly. It's, it's DFP in that regard. Clearly, we should be taking every effort we can to make uh, the admission to the building and indeed uh, the stormant experience, for want of a better word, as, as best it can. Um, in terms of the, the parking issue, uh, the Assembly management continued to discuss this matter with DFP colleagues and exploring further possibilities for improving this situation. One positive measure that's already emerged uh, is the handing over for management by Assembly staff of the Lower East Park and the establishment of an overspill, overspill car park. That's provided the Assembly with an additional 42 uh, parking spaces. Uh, there is, I think, DFP, and I suppose there's a limited amount I can answer for them, uh, have carried a broader review of parking within the Storm Estate. Now, at this stage, we understand there are no plans with DFP to provide additional car parks. However, I think um, there are indications on behalf of DFP that, that they are considering, uh, on periods where there is inordinately high demand for parking, temporarily relaxing some of the, park, the current parking restrictions uh, on the Prince of Wales and Massey Avenues. Um, I think naturally the Assembly management will work closely in monitoring this and can continue to liaise with, with DFP, but principally given the fact of the restrictions of the area that's directly controlled by the 
Assembly Commission, at best that we can be uh, an organisation which influences some change there. Uh, ultimately, most of the actions lie within the direct remit of, of the Department of Finance and Personnel. Phil Flanagan. I get a free ask on Cordy, and I thank the Commission member for his answer. Um, I want to, to deal with the, the whole issue of, of how this building is heated and, and the the area of the estate which falls under its control, because when I asked the, the former Minister of Finance and Personnel what opportunities there were for storing biomass here, he told me that there wasn't space within the estate to build a shed. Um, so can I ask the member whether the Commission would consider engaging with DFP to see if there is somewhere within this estate where a shed could be built to store biomass to heat this building? Well, it does seem to move slightly from the, uh, the original intention of the question on the, on the control of the environment. Certainly, I think anything which produces the, the most efficient energy, indeed the best heating, um, quite often there's a lot of hot air I think comes from this chamber that may be able to, that sometimes goes to waste in that regard. Clearly I think the Assembly Commission is open to any suggestions uh, that can improve energy efficiency within the building. Um, I suppose there are ongoing discussions on a range of issues at times with DFP on the interaction between the, the Assembly itself and the estate and I'm sure uh, that is a matter which I'm sure could be uh, discussed with the uh, Department of Finance and Personnel. But really, I suppose, ultimately, as they control over the estate, it's probably at best, probably best uh, maybe directed towards them, at least at first instance. Ms. Sandra Overland. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, um, and I had previously thought of uh, asking the member about negotiations with the Department of a finance and Personnel on extending car parks. But what comes to mind is uh, there's been an area cleared to the back of Parliament buildings uh, for the roof project. Is there any thought uh, about maybe using that cleared area for parking afterwards? I think, uh, I think that's certainly the case. Um, in terms of the, the roof project, obviously that's something that will be ongoing for the best part of a year. Um, I suppose in answer to that, that was cleared out, if you like, initially for the, the idea of um, being able to facilitate the work that goes on the roof project. However, I think the intention would be that because the space now is cleared, that once the roof project is then completed, there will actually be the opportunity for additional car parking arising out of that. And it will be a space having been created that then can be, can be used. So it has long-term benefits as opposed to just simply the, the situation of allowing additional space. And obviously, any action that we can take which can ease the level of congestion and parking around Parliament buildings, I think, will be to an advantage of everyone. And the chef. And the chef. Rosie McCauley. I have got a prayer last on Collier. Catch the Kugler, the whole question five. I thank the member for her question. The Assembly Commission has taken a range of steps to ensure that Parliament buildings is inclusive. Section 75 of the Northern Ireland 1998 Act uh, requires all public authorities designated for the purposes of the Act, including the Assembly Commission, to comply with two statutory duties. The first duty is the equality of opportunity uh, duty, which requires public authorities in carrying out their functions relating to Northern Ireland to have due regard to the need to promote equality of opportunity between the nine equality categories that are listed in section 75. The Assembly's 2012 to 2016 equality scheme is a statement of the arrangements for fulfilling uh, the statutory duties and also the plan for implementation. It meets uh, both the legal requirements of the Schedule 9 of the 1998 Act. The second duty uh, is the good relations duty, and that requires that public authorities, in carrying out their functions relating to Northern Ireland, have uh, regard to the desirability of promoting good relations between persons of different religious beliefs, political opinion and racial uh, group. The member may wish to note that in a letter from the Equality Commission in uh, October 2013, they wrote, and I quote, it has been encouraging to note that the Northern Ireland Assembly has sustained consistent project, uh, pro, uh, sorry, progress in the implementation of their equality scheme, and there, is no, and there is evidence of effectiveness in meeting the Section 75 duties. There has been sustained engagement and consultation with those directly affected by the policies, and this has been a key achievement of the Northern Ireland Assembly scheme. A clear culture exists in the organisation that fosters cooperation with other parts of the public sector and those affected by statutory duty. End quote. In addition, the Assembly Commission has uh, taken a number of steps to promote inclusion within Parliament buildings. Those include action on hearing loss, autism initiative, disability action plan, gender equality, Assembly Community uh, Connect, tours and educational visits, um, and indeed a Chinese New Year event, Chinese New Year event uh, looking at art. The member will appreciate the challenges of obtaining political agreement on some of the more contentious issues around good relations. 
mind the particular responders, the two-minute rule applies. Ms. Rosalie. Um, I think the member for, for that answer. Um, in the planning of the Can I ask the member what plans does the Assembly Commission have to expand the use of Irish in Parliament buildings? Well, obviously as regards... Uh, Obviously, we're always with regard to good relations and indeed ensuring the promotion of good relations. Uh, specifically, obviously, while there's further discussions always take place in these issues, I don't think there's any specific agreement as yet on any expansion of, of Irish within the building. Dr. Dominic Bradley. In fact, in the case of the Carts Europe on the on Changak Ethnic August Monday, could I ask the member uh, what the, the the Assembly has recently been criticised for fulfilling to fulfil its duties under the European Charter for Ethnic and Minority Languages? Can I ask him what action the Commission intends to take in, in order to change that situation? I wasn't directly aware of the criticism in connection with it. We've produced a, a good relations action plan which looks at a wider context of that. Um, as, certainly as, as regards that, I think we've got to ensure that whatever we have by way of a welcoming environment uh, within the assembly buildings is one that's a welcoming to everyone. And that, I think, by way of any actions that are taken in any direction uh, can also have consequences in terms of the um, attitude that people feel from different communities in that regard. So I think we've always got to look uh, at trying to be inclusive as possible, but also in such a way then not to alienate people. Mr. Danny Kinahan. Okay, I just uh, wonder, is there actually any evidence from visitors to suggest that Parliament buildings are not inclusive? Well, I'm not aware of any evidence to suggest that. As indicated, I think, to a previous answer, uh, we do have a wide range of groups from across the community, from different communities, from minority communities, uh, and there does seem to be a good level of outreach there and usage of the, the building. Um, and so therefore I'm not, I'm not certainly aware of um, any evidence uh, which could suggest to the contrary. However, I'm sure somebody could, uh, I'm not ruling out the possibility that somebody could produce evidence of, of, of that nature, but I'm not aware of any. You and I call Mr. Chris Little. Question six. On behalf of the Commission. Uh, again, I thank the member for his question. The Assembly Commission does not currently have a policy in place for lighting the exterior of Parliament buildings. The Commission has agreed on two occasions previously, in conjunction with other high ranking profile public buildings, to light the exterior of the building. In order to achieve the desired effect, gel filters had been purchased by the Commission. In addition, permanent uplighters have been fitted in the Great Hall, enabling many different shades of light to be applied internally. For example, at a recent event held in the Great Hall to mark ovarian cancer awareness. However, due to the increasing number of calls to light the exterior of the building, the Commission has agreed to put in place a policy so that appropriate controls are in place to ensure that this is done in a manner that befits the listed status of the building. Little for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the, the member for the answer. I, I welcome the announcement that the Commission is going to undertake a, a policy in relation to uh, lighting the exterior of Parliament buildings. I, I would ask the member if he agrees that buildings like Belfast City Hall have been used to really good effect to raise <coughs> awareness of, of health awareness campaigns and indeed uh, charitable causes. So I welcome that and look forward to hearing more detail about it. Uh, member of the Commission agree with me that it would have been really nice if the exterior of this building had been illuminated in green yesterday <laughs> to, to symbolise the unifying nature of St. Patrick, something which thousands of people across the North shared 
yesterday. Is that a plan for the future, perhaps? I, I thank uh, the member for his question. Uh, it's a question which <clears throat> I think <clears throat> is a rhetorical question because we have passed that stage, but I'm sure it will be taken into consideration when we are developing a policy. And I thank the member for that. To Phil Flanagan. I get the free last concurrent. I want to assure the member that mine is not a rhetorical question. Um, many historical and, and, and very um, prominent places around the world went green as part of the Global Greening Initiative. It's actually an initiative taken by Tourism Ireland, um, which is one of the bodies funded by this assembly and by the executive. So, can I ask the member? I raised this issue last year, and there doesn't appear to have been any progress. Can I ask the member whether he would take it back into the commission to see, um, in, in a spirit of inclusivity, to actually promote this building? Um, as a place for people to visit, actually put it on the map. Would he consider um, getting this place to turn green for St. Patrick's Day next year? <clears throat> well, as I said, uh, the Commission is certainly going to consider a policy and uh, will take on board what, what we've heard <clears throat> here this afternoon. But certainly, whatever we do, it can enhance the situation, but whatever we do has to be also with regard to this, the status of the building. For example, there was one picture someone did ask me about uh, in another place. Uh, where, in fact, the Parliament building was shown as all sorts of different colours. Uh, and it, it certainly wasn't the case. Obviously, a lot can be done with Photoshop and all these sort of things now to change things. But that sort of thing tended to be a bit sort of um, perhaps cheap would be maybe a word for it, but a, a bit of a nonsense really is not fair. But uh, I, hear, I hear what the member says. <laughs> oh, Miss Karen McKevitt. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question 7. Thank you, um, Member, uh, for, for, for that question. Um, Jude is not here. I'll attempt to answer it here. Um, the Assembly Commission does not establish the eligibility criteria or the level of support provided to members in respect of childcare. That function falls to the Independent Financial Review Panel. It's the second time I've mentioned it here this afternoon. The scheme for staff relates to childcare costs incurred while the parents are at work at the assembly. There are two separate tiers of support. The first tier is for children up to the age of five, or school age, whichever is earlier, and is paid at the rate of £38.90 per week. The second tier is for children up to the age of 14 and is paid at the rate of £18.90 per week. The eligibility criteria for secretariat staff include a requirement that actual childcare costs exceed the above rates, that the, the parent submits a valid claim each month setting out the days when they, were, when they were at work and that the child's date of birth is verified by reference to his or her birth certificate. For a Thank, you. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can the Commissioner ha uh, highlight how this information uh, is put out to those that do qualify for the scheme? I think um, it, it has been uh, made available by direct communication, if I understand correctly. Uh, but I'm not sure whether it's on the website, so I'll check and get back to the member on that one. It's a good point. Mr. Chris. Can the member outline what, what the Assembly Commission have done in relation to providing crash facilities? Well, that's obviously not part of the scheme, and I think the answer is uh, it's really a matter for the member or staff member to find their own, whatever suits them best, uh, and probably best left that way. Good, and I call Mr. Michael Copeland. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Commission to outline the reasons why the lift on the east side of Parliament buildings has been so frequently out of operation recently? Cash never a knee. Cash never a knee for those who, who don't think that more needs to be done for Irish speakers here. Um, to ask this, Gown Buechus Leshen Gualta Egg Asan Kest. Loch and Tardy Hori Div Erher on Ergna Vimi Balten and Blian and Uru. August Rinna and Hinnel Tori Servi Shamach Nach Mesha Sawalcha on Tardy Hor Akar Robert Arish Kajigan Yarn on Jeshukhan August and Takhoru Avi Riaktanak. I'd like to thank the member for their question 
and the lift at the east side of the building suffered a mechanical breakdown in May last year and the service engineers concluded it would not be safe to bring the lift back into service until essential repair and refurbishment work was undertaken. This work was due to be carried out during the summer recess of 2013 as part of a programme of planned refurbishment work. However, the operators of the service contract, DFP Properties Management Branch, were not content with the appointment of the contractor and determined they were required to re-tender the contract. The contract has now been re-tendered and a contractor has been appointed to carry out the work. In order to try to minimise the noise and disruption, this has been programmed to take place during the Easter recess period. Mr Copeland for a supplementary. Um, thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, for your kindness during the last faux pas. Uh, well, can the Minister detail approximately how much has been spent on the, the maintenance of this lift during the period that it hasn't been in operation? How much is generally spent on the maintenance of elevators and lifts in the building and will she accept that for people like myself who on occasions have mobility difficulties, not only members but members of staff, members of the public, the um, unreliability of the lifts, particularly if there's a division bell, can cause very great difficulties? I do accept that um, it does cause uh, difficulties and I do accept that it should have been uh, refurbished by now. Uh, to, com to fulfil our disability and our equality uh, duties. Um, all I can say is the DFP branch insisted that it be retendered. Um, but I, I, we will make sure that, I've, I've said Easter 2014, and we will do everything we can to ensure that it is completed. Secondly, I, I'm answering this question for Judith Cochran, so I'm sorry I don't have all the details in relation to costs, but we can certainly provide the member with those costs. Mr. Pat Sheehan. Got a free Court of case to Jay. Question 10, please. Principal Speaker, um, can I thank first of all the member for his question? I suppose it falls into two parts. Uh, with regard to the issue of answering questions for oral response within the Chamber, the Commission does provide parallel translation when requested to enable a member to respond in the language of their choice. In relation to the answering of questions for written response, the Commission in May 2013 determined that questions for a written response would be, the answer, would be answered in the language in which they were received. In effect, this means that the questions are responded to in English only. Commission and Channel. Would the member not agree with me that some members are excluded from using uh, Irish here in the Assembly as a result of the Assembly Commission's policy of not taking written or oral questions in Irish? Well, with respect, there seems to be a degree of misunderstanding as regards that the Procedures within the chamber are that if somebody is speaking in a language other than English, that they have to provide their own simultaneous translation. As regards to the written uh, answers, those aren't actually determined in terms of the, the way that they are received by the Commission. Uh, because it, if I picked up the member correctly, it was with reference to um, the member submitting that he was referring to. Uh, it's not for the responsibility of the Commission to determine the procedures in relation to the submission of questions to the Assembly. Uh, that is actually a matter that's determined by the business office and isn't a matter for uh, the Commission. So from that point of view, I think that questions are forwarded to the Commission in the same way as they're forwarded, as I understand it, to other government departments. But it's a question essentially on that basis for the business office rather than uh, the Commission to determine that. Mr Stephen Moodry. Question 11, Principal Deputy Speaker. Garmagat <laughs> Nagoras Fashnisha, Comas Nas Giderlin and Chanol, of Fiha, Megi Giton, the second, Gadachid, Megi Gikon, the second, Lejela Leshni Rektanish Bresha, O Jairi, O Horus Riev Fahashta, 
Nagoshti, Agus Ousaj Vresh in the service of Idrilin. By a Kug Vila Ked Octopunt, and Costas Bresha, Le Dachat Megi Gaton, a Halahar. Can I thank the member for his question? In March 2011, the Assembly Commission procured an independent internet connection for use in Parliament buildings. The hardware and installation cost for this service was £54,595, with recurring annual costs of £14,260 per annum. In January 2013, Information Systems Office increased the capacity of the Assembly Internet Connection from 20 to 40 megabytes per second to cope with the additional demands brought about by the introduction of the Electronic Committee PAC system and the overall increased use of Internet services. The additional cost to flex up to 40 megabytes per second was 5,180 per annum. The Information Systems Office closely monitors the performance and availability of the internet service and the current connection is performing well with no major delays or congestion detected. The Assembly Commission has, however, approved the procurement of an additional independent connection for Parliament buildings to provide contingency arrangements for business critical procedural and corporate systems reliant on internet connectivity. This will effectively double the internet band available from 40 megabits to 80 megabytes. Sir, uh, time is up.